Hello, friends. This is the reading of part two of chapter one of J.R.R. Tolkien's The Hobbit. If you remember last time, Bilbo, who does not like adventures and anything unexpected, has been visited by 13 dwarves and the wizard Gandalf. And I'm going to pick up right where we left off in the middle of this party. Put on a few eggs. There's a good fellow, Gandalf called after him as the hobbit stumped off to the pantries. And just bring out the cold chicken and pickles. Seems to know as much about the inside of my larders as I do myself, thought Mr. Baggins, who was feeling positively flummoxed. And he was beginning to wonder whether a most wretched adventure had not come right into his house. By the time he had got all the bottles and dishes and knives and forks and glasses and plates and spoons and things piled up on big trays, he was getting very hot and red in the face and annoyed. Confusti confusticate and bother these dwarves, he said out loud. Why don't they come and lend a hand? Lo and behold, there stood Balin and Dwalin at the door of the kitchen and Philly and Killy behind them. And before he could say knife, they had whisked the trays and a couple of small tables into the parlor and set out everything afresh. Gandalf sat at the head of the party with the 13 dwarves all around, and Bilbo sat on a stool at the fireside, nibbling at a biscuit. His appetite was quite taken away, and trying to look as if this was all perfectly ordinary and not in the least an adventure. The dwarves ate and ate and talked and talked, and time got on. At last, they pushed their chairs back, and Bilbo made a move to collect the plates and glasses. I suppose you will all stay to supper? he said in his politest, unpressing tones. Of course, said Thorin, and after. We shan't get through the business till late. We must have some music first, now to clear up. Thereupon the twelve dwarves, not Thorin, he was too important, and stayed talking to Gandalf, jumped up to their feet and made tall piles of all the things. Off they went, not waiting for the trays, balancing columns of plates, each with a bottle on the top, with one hand, while the hobbit ran after them, squeaking with fright. Please be careful, and please don't trouble. I can manage. But the dwarves only started to sing. Chip the glasses, crock the plates, blunt the knives, and bend the forks. That's what Bilbo Baggins hates. Smash the bottles, burn the corks, cut the cloth, and tread the fat. Pour the milk on the pantry floor, leave the bones on the bedroom mat. Splash the wine on every door. Dump the crocks in a boiling bowl. Pound them with a, a, with a thumping pole. And when you've finished, if any are whole, send them down the hall to roll. That's what Bilbo Baggins hates. So carefully, carefully, with the plates. And of course, they did none of these dreadful things, and everything was cleaned and put away safe as quick as lightning, while the hobbit was turning around and round in the middle of the kitchen, trying to see what they were doing. Then they went back and found Thorin with his feet on the fender, smoking a pipe. He was blowing the most enormous smoke rings, and wherever he told one to go, it went, up the chimney or behind the clock or on the mantelpiece or under the table or around and around the ceiling. But wherever it went, it was not quick enough to escape Gandalf. Pop! He sent a smaller smoke ring from his short clay pipe straight through each one of Thorin's. Then Gandalf's smoke ring would go green and come back to hover over the wizard's head. He had a cloud of them about him already, and in the dim light, it made him look strange and sorcerous. Bilbo stood still and watched. He loved smoke rings, and then he blushed to think how proud he had been yesterday morning of the smoke rings he had sent up in the wind over the hill. Now for some music, said Thorin. Bring out the instruments. Killy and Philly rushed for their bags and brought back little fiddles. Dory, Nori, and Ori brought out flutes from somewhere inside their coats. Bomber produced a drum from the hall. Biffer and Boffer went out too and came back with clarinets and they had left nothing, um, and they had left, ah, came back with clarinets they had left among the walking sticks. Dwalin and Balin said, excuse me, I left mine on the porch. Just bring mine in with you, said Thorin. They came back with vials as big as themselves and with Thorin's harp wrapped in a green cloth. It was a beautiful golden harp, and when Thorin struck it, and struck it, the music began all at once. 
so sudden and so sweet that Bilbo forgot everything else and was swept away into the dark lands under strange moons far over the water and very far from his hobbit hole under the hill. The dark came into the room from a little window that opened to the side of the hill. The firelight flickered. It was April, and they still played on. While the shadow of Gandalf's beard wagged against the wall, the dark filled all the room, and the fire died down, and the shadows were lost, and still they played on. And suddenly, first one and then another began to sing as they played, deep-throated singing of the dwarves in the deep places of their ancient homes. And this is like a fragment of their song, if it can be like their song without their music. Far over the misty mountains cold, to dungeons deep and caverns old, we must away ere break of day to seek the pale enchanted gold. The dwarves of yore made mighty spells while hammers fell like ringing bells in places deep where dark things sleep in hollow halls beneath the fells. For ancient king and elvish lord, their many a gleaming golden hoard, they shaped and wrought and light they caught to hide in gems on hilt of sword. On silver necklaces they strung, the flowering stars on crowns they hung, the dragon fire and twisted wire, they meshed the light of moon and sun. Far over the misty mountains cold, to dungeons deep and caverns old, we must away ere break of day to claim our long forgotten gold. Goblets they carved there for themselves, and harps of gold where no man dells. There lay they long, and many a song was sung unheard by men or elves. The pines were roaring in the, on the height, the winds were moaning in the night, the fire was red and flaming spread, the trees like torches blazed with light. The bells were ringing in the dale, and men looked up with faces pale, the dragon's ire, more fierce than fire, laid low their towers and houses frail. The mountain smoked beneath the moon. The dwarves, they heard the tramp of doom. They fled their hall to dying fall beneath his feet, beneath the moon. Far over the misty mountain grim, to dungeons deep and caverns dim, we must away ere break of day to win our harps and gold from him. As they sang, the hobbit felt the love of beautiful things made by hands and by cunning and by magic moving through him. A fierce and a jealous love, the desire of the hearts of dwarves. Then something tookish woke up inside him, and he wished to go and see the great mountains and hear the pine trees and the waterfalls and explore the caves and wear a sword instead of a walking stick. He looked out of the window. The stars were out in a dark sky above the trees. He thought of the jewels of the dwarves shining in dark caverns. Suddenly in the wood beyond the water, a flame leapt up, probably someone lighting a wood fire, and he thought of plundering dragons settling on his quiet hill and kindling it all into flames. He shuddered, and very quickly, he was playing Mr. Baggins bag in under hill again. He got up trembling. He had less than half a mind to fetch the lamp and more than half a mind to pretend to and go and hide behind the beer barrels in the cellar and not come out again until all the dwarves had gone away. Suddenly he found that the music and the singing had stopped and they were all looking at him with eyes shining in the dark. Where are you going? said Thord in a tone that seemed to show that he guessed both halves of the hobbit's mind. What about a little light? said Bilbo apologetically. We like the dark, said all the dwarves. Dark for dark business. There are many hours before dawn. Of course, said Bilbo, and sat down in a hurry. He missed his tool and sat on the fender, knocking over the poker and the shovel with a crash. Hush, said Gandalf. Let Thorin speak. And this is how Thorin began. Gandalf, dwarves, and Mr. Baggins... We are met together in the house of our friend and fellow conspirator, this most excellent and audacious hobbit. May the hair on his toes never fall out. All praise to his wine and ale. He paused for breath and for a polite remark from the hobbit, but the compliments were quite lost on poor Bilbo Baggins, who was wagging his mouth in protest at being called audacious, and worst of all, fellow conspirator. Though no noise came out, 
he was so flummoxed. So Thorin went on. We are met to discuss our plans, our ways, means, policy, and devices. We shall soon, before the break of day, start on our long journey, a journey from which some of us, or perhaps all of us, except our friend and counselor, the ingenious wizard Gandalf, may never return. It is a solemn moment. Our object is, I take it, well known to us all, to the, uh, in, to the estimable Mr. Baggins, and perhaps to one or two of the younger dwarves, I think, I should be right in naming Killian Philly, for instance. The exact situation at the moment may require a little brief explanation. This was Thornton's style. He was an important dwarf. If he had been allowed, he would probably have gone on like this until he was out of breath without telling anyone there anything that was not known already. But he was rudely interrupted. Poor Bilbo couldn't bear it any longer. At may never return, he began to feel a shriek coming up inside, and very soon it burst out like the whistle of an engine coming out of a tunnel. All the dwarves sprang up, knocking over the table. Gandalf uh, struck a blue light on the end of his magic staff, and in, his, and in its firework glare, the poor little hobbit could be seen kneeling on the hearth rug, shaking like a, like a jelly that was melting. Then he fell flat on the floor and kept on calling out, struck by lightning, struck by lightning! over and over again. And that was all they could get out of him for a long time. So they took him and laid him out of the way on the drawing room sofa with a drink at his elbow, and they went back to their dark business. Excitable little fellow, said Gandalf as they sat down. Again, gets funny queer fits, but he is one of the best, one of the best, as fierce as a dragon in a pinch. If you've ever seen a dragon in a pinch, you will realize that this was only poetical exaggeration applied to any hobbit, even to old Took's great-grand-uncle uh, Bullroarer, who was so huge for a hobbit that he could ride a horse. He charged the ranks of the goblins of Mount Grom at the Battle of Green Fields and knocked their king, Gomfimble's head, clean off with a wooden club. It sailed a hundred yards through the air and went down a rabbit hole. And in this way, the battle was won and the game of golf invented at the same moment. In the meanwhile, however, Bull Roarer's gentler descendant was reviving in the drawing room. After a while, he, um, after a while and a drink, he crept nervously to the door of the parlor. This is what he heard. Glowing speaking. Hmm. On, or some snort or less like that. Will he do, do you think? It is all very well for Gandalf to talk about this hobbit being fierce, but one shriek like that in a, moment, in a moment of excitement would be enough to wake the dragon and all his relatives and kill the lot of us. I think it sounded more like fright than excitement. In fact, if it had not been for the sign on the door, I should have been sure we had come to the wrong house. As soon as I clapped my eyes on this little fellow bobbing and puffing in the mat, I had my doubts. He looks more like a grocer than a burglar. Then Mr. Baggins turned the handle and went in. The took side had won. He suddenly felt he would go without bed and breakfast He thought he, and be thought fierce. As for little fellow bobbing on the mat, it almost made him really fierce. Many a time afterward, the Baggins part regretted what he did now, and he said to himself, Bilbo, you were a fool. You walked right in and put your foot in it. Pardon me, he said. If I have overheard words that you were saying, I don't pretend to understand what you were talking about or your reference to burglars, but I think I am right in believing, this is what he called, this is what he called being in, on his dignity, that you think I am no good. I'll show you. I have no signs on my door. It was painted a week ago, and I am quite sure you have come to the wrong house. As soon as I saw your funny faces on the doorstep, I had my doubts. But treat it as the right one. Tell me what you have done. Tell me what you want done, and I will try it. If I have to walk from here to the east of the east and fight the wild wereworms in the last desert. I had a great, great, great granduncle once bull, bull roarer took, and... Yes, yes, but that was long ago, said Glowen. I was talking about you, and I assure you that there is a mark on this door, the usual one in the trade, or it used to be, 
Burglar wants a good job, plenty of excitement, and reasonable reward. That's how it is usually read. You can say expert treasure hunter instead of burglar if you like. Some of them do. It's all the same to us. Gandalf told us that there was a man of that sort in these parts looking for a job at once, and that he had arranged for a meeting here this Wednesday at tea time. Of course, there's a mark, said Gandalf. I put it there myself for very good reasons. You asked me to find the 14th man for your expedition, and I chose Mr. Baggins. Just let anyone say I chose the wrong man or the wrong house, and you can stop at 13 and have all the bad luck you like, or go back to digging coal. He scowled so angrily at Glowin that the dwarf huddled back in his chair, and when Bilbo tried to open his mouth to ask a question, he turned and frowned at him and stuck out his bushy eyebrows till Bilbo shut his mouth tight with a snap. That's right said Gandalf. Let's have no more argument. I have chosen Mr. Baggins, and that ought to be enough for all of you. If I say he is a burglar, a burglar he is, or will be when the time comes. There's a lot more in him than you guess, and a deal more that he has any idea of himself. You may, possibly, all live to thank me yet. Now, Bilbo, my boy, fetch the lamp, and let's have a little light on this. On the table, in the light of a big lamp, was with a red shade, he spread out a piece of parchment, rather like a map. This was made by Thror, your grandfather, Thorin, he said. In answer to the dwarf's excited questions, it's a plan of the mountain. I don't see that this will help us much, said Thorin, disappointedly after a glance. I remember the mountain well enough, and the lands about it. I know where Mirkwood is, and the withered heath, and the great dragon's bread. There is a dragon marked in red on the mountain, said Balin, but it will be easy enough to find him without that, if ever we arrive there. There is one point that you haven't noticed, said the wizard, and that is the secret entrance. You see that rune on the west side on the hand pointing to it from the other runes? That marks a hidden passage to the lower halls. Look at the map in this chapter. You will see where the, that the runes are in red. It may have been secret once, said Thorin, but how do we know that it is secret any longer? Old Smog has lived there long enough to find out everything there is to know about those caves. He may, but he can't have used it for years and years. Why? Because it is too small. Five feet high at the door and three feet and three may walk abreast, say the runes. But Smog could not creep into a hole that size, not even when he was a young dragon. Certainly not after devouring so many of the dwarves and men of Dale. It seems a great big hole to me, squeaked Bilbo, who had no experience of dragons and only of hobbit-sized holes. He was getting excited and interested again, so that he forgot to keep his mouth shut. He loved maps, and in his hall there hung a large one of the country round and with all of his favorite walks marked on it in red ink. How could such a large door be kept secret from everyone outside, apart from the dragon, he asked. He was only a little hobbit, you must remember. In lots of ways, said Gandalf, but in what way this one has been hidden, we don't know without going to see. From what it says on the map, I should guess that there is a closed door which has been made to look exactly like the side of the mountain. That is the usual dwarf's method, I think. That is right, isn't it? Quite right, said Thorin. Also, went on Gandalf, I forgot to mention that with the map went a key, a small and curious key. Here it is he said, and handed it to Thorin. It's a key with a long barrel and intricate wards made of silver. Keep it safe. Indeed I will, said Thorin, and he fastened it upon a fine chain that hung about his neck and under his jacket. Now things begin to look more hopeful. This news alters them much for the better. So far we had no clear idea what to do. We thought of going east as quiet and careful as we could as far as the long lake. After that the trouble would begin. A long time before that, if I know anything about the roads east, interrupted Gandalf, we might go from there up along the river running, went on Thorin, taking no notice, and so to the ruins of Dale, the old town in the valley there under the shadow of the mountain. But none of us liked the idea of the front gate. The river runs right out through it and the great cliff at the south of the mountain, and out of it comes the dragon too, far too often unless he has changed his habits. That would be no good, said the wizard. Not without a mighty warrior, even a hero. 
I tried to find one, but warriors are busy fighting one another in distant lands, and in this neighborhood heroes are scarce, or simply not to be found. Swords in these parts are mostly blunt, and axes are used for trees, shields as cradles or dish covers, and dragons are comfortably far off and therefore legendary. That is why I settled on burglary, especially when I remembered the existence of a side door. And here is our little Bilbo Baggins, the burglar, the chosen and selected burglar. Now, let's get on and make some plans. Very well then, said Thorin, supposing the burglar expert gives us some ideas or suggestions. He turned with mock politeness to Bilbo. First, I should like to know a bit more about things, said he, feeling all confused and a bit shaky inside, but so far still tookishly determined to go on with things. I mean about the gold and the dragon and all that, and how it got here, and how it got there, and who it belongs to, and so on and further. Bless me, said Thorin. Haven't you got a map? And didn't you hear our song? And haven't you been talking about all this for hours? All the same, I should like it all plain and clear, said he said obstinately, putting on his business manner, usually reserved for people who tried to borrow money off of him, and doing his best to appear wise and prudent and professional and live up to Gandalf's recommendation. Also, I should like to know about risks, out-of-pocket expenses, time required, and remuneration, and so forth. By which he meant, what am I going to get out of it? And am I going to come back alive? Oh, very well, said Thorin. Long ago, in my grandfather Thor's time, our family was driven out of the far north and came back with all their wealth and their tools to this mountain on the map. It had been discovered by my far ancestor Thrain, the, Thrain the Old. But now they mined and they tunneled and they made huger halls and ever greater workshops. And in addition, I believe they found a good deal of gold and a great many jewels too. Anyway, they grew immensely rich and famous, and my grandfather was king under the mountain again, and treated with great reverence by the moral men who lived in the south, who, and were gradually spreading up the running river as far as the valley overshadowed by the mountain. They built the merry town of Dale there in those days, Kings used to send for our smiths and reward even the least skillful most richly. Fathers would beg us to take their sons as apprentices and pay us handsomely, especially in food supplies, which we never bothered to grow or find for ourselves. Altogether, those were good days for us. And the poorest of us had money to spend and to lend and leisure to make beautiful things just for the fun of it, not to speak of the most marvelous and magical toys, the like of which is not to be found in the world nowadays. So my grandfather's halls became full of armor and jewels and carvings and cups, and the toy market of Dale was the wonder of the north. Undoubtedly, that was what brought the dragon. Dragons steal gold and jewels, you know, from men and elves and dwarves, wherever they can find them, and they guard their plunder as long as they live, which is practically forever unless they are killed, and never enjoy a brass ring of it. Indeed, they hardly know a good bit of work from a, from a bad, though they usually have a good notion of the current market value, and they can't make a thing for themselves, not even mend a little loose scale of their armor. There were lots of dragons in the north in those days, and gold was probably getting scarce up there, with the dwarves flying south or getting killed, and all the general waste and destruction that dragons make going from bad to worse. There was a most specially greedy, strong, and wicked worm called Smog. One day, he flew into the air and came south. The first we heard of it was a noise like a hurricane coming from the north, and the pine trees on the mountain creaking and cracking in the wind. Some of the dwarves who happened to be outside, I was one luckily, a fine adventurous lad in those days, always wondering about, and it saved my life that day. Well, from a good way off, we saw the dragon settle on, the, on our mountain in a spout of flame. Then he came down the slopes, and when he reached the woods, they all went up in fire. By that time, all the bells were ringing in Dale, and the warriors were arming. The dwarves rushed out of their great gate, but there was, but there was the dragon waiting for them. None escaped that day. 
the river rushed up in stream, and a fog fell on Dale, and in the fog the dragon came on them and destroyed most of the warriors. The usual unhappy story. It was only too common in those days. Then he went back and crept in through the front gate and routed out all the halls and lanes and tunnels, alleys, cellars, mansions, and passages. After that, there were no dwarves left alive inside, and he took all their wealth for himself. Probably, for that is the dragon's way. He has probably piled it all up in a great heap inside and sleeps on it for a bed. Later, he used to crawl out of the great gate and come by night to Dale and carry away people, especially maidens, to eat until Dale was ruined and all the people dead or gone. What goes on there, there now, I don't know for certain, but I don't suppose anyone lives nearer the, to the mountain than the edge of Long Lake nowadays. The few of us that were well outside sat and wept in hiding and cursed small. And there we were unexpectedly joined by my father and my grandfather with, with singed beards. They looked very grim, but they said very little. When I asked how they had got away, they told me to hold my tongue and said that one day in the proper time I should know. After that, we went away and we have had to, we have had to earn our living as best we could up and down the lands, often through sinking as low as blacksmith work or even coal mining, but we have never forgotten our stolen treasure. And even now, when I will allow, when I will allow, we have a good bit laid by and are not so badly off. Here Thorin stroked the gold chain around his neck. We still mean to get it back and to bring our curses home to smog if we can. I have often wondered about my father's and my grandfather's escape. I see now they must have had a private side door, which only they knew about. But apparently they made a map, and I shouldn't. And I should like to know how Gandalf got hold of it, and why it did not come down to me, the rightful heir. I did not get hold of it if I was given it," said the wizard. "Your grandfather Thor was killed, you remember, in the mines of Moria by Azog the Goblin." Curse his name, yes, said Thorin. And Thran, your father, went away on the 21st of April, a hundred years ago last Thursday, and has never been seen by you since. True, true, said Thorin. Well, your father gave me this to give to you, and if I have chosen my own time and way for handing it over, you can hardly blame me, considering the trouble I had to find you. Your father could not remember his own name when he gave me the paper, and he never told me yours. So on the whole, I think I ought to be praised and thanked. Here it is, said he, handing the map to Thorin. I don't understand, said Thorin, and Bilbo felt he would have liked to say the same. The explanation did not seem to explain. Your grandfather, said the wizard slowly and grimly, gave the map to his son for safety before he went to the mines of Moria. Your father went away to try his luck with the map after your grandfather was killed. And lots of adventures of a most unpleasant sort he had, but he never got near the mountain. How he got there, I don't know, but I found him a prisoner in the dungeons of the necromancer. Whatever were you doing there? asked Thorin with a shudder, and all the dwarves shivered. Never you mind, I was finding things out as usual, and a nasty dangerous business it was. Even I, Gandalf, only just escaped. I tried to save your father, but it was too late. He was witless and wandering and had forgotten almost everything except the map and the key. We have long ago paid the goblins of Moria, said Thor. We must give a thought now to the necromancer. Don't be absurd. He is an enemy far beyond the powers of all the dwarves put together. If they could all be collected again from the four corners of the world, the one thing your father wished was for his son to read the map and use the key. The dragon and the mountain are more than big enough tasks for you. Hear, hear, said Bilbo, and accidentally said it out loud. Hear what, they all said, turning suddenly towards him. And he was so flustered that he answered, Hear what I have got to say. What's that, they asked. Well, I should say that you ought to go east and have a look around. After all, there is the side door, and dragons must sleep sometimes, I suppose. If you sit on the doorstep long enough, I dare say you will think of something. And well, don't you know, I think we've talked long enough for one night, if you see what I mean. What about bed and an early start and all that? 
I will give you a good breakfast before you go. Before we go, I suppose you mean, said Thorin. Aren't you the burglar? And is it sitting on the doorstep your job? Not to speak of getting inside the door. But I agree about bed and breakfast. I like six eggs with my ham when starting out on a journey. Fried, not poached, and mind you, don't break them. After all the orders, after all, after all the others had ordered their breakfast without so much as a please, which annoyed Bilbo very much, they all got up. The Hobbit had to find room for them all and filled all of his spare rooms and made beds on chairs and sofas before he got them all stowed and went to his own little bed, very tired and not altogether happy. One thing he did make up his mind about was not to bother to get up very early and cook everybody else's wretched breakfast. The tookishness was wearing off, and he was now quite he was now quite he was not now quite so sure he was going going on any journey in the morning. As he lay in bed, he could hear Thorin still humming to himself in the be, in the best bedroom next to him. Far over the misty mountains cold, to dungeons deep and caverns old, we must away ere break of day to find our long forgotten gold. Bilbo went to sleep with that in his ears, and it gave him very uncomfortable dreams. It was not long after the break of day when he woke up. That is the end of chapter one of The Hobbit.